Hello and welcome back to Paleocast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 120 on the remarkable discovery of an ammonite without its shell. So what happened to separate the ammonite from its conch? And now that it's gone, what can we actually see of the soft body anatomy? Joining us to answer these questions and more is Professor Christian Klug from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. But before we get into the episode, just want to wish you all a happy 2021, and here's hoping that this year will be much better than the last. Thanks so much for all the messages we've had through recently, it's been great talking, and I'm so glad that this podcast has been something to look forward to for so many of you. It really does mean a lot to get that feedback. It's also why I'm feeling a bit guilty about only putting an episode out an hour in February, but sometimes this just happens. It's the start of a new term and interviewees all had hectic schedules with the festive period and also a global pandemic to deal with. But we're back on track now, so expect more great interviews in the weeks and months ahead. As always, we have pictures on our website that accompany this episode, and this really is an interview where you need to be looking at the pictures. Whether that's to trace cephalopod evolution on a tree, or just to have a look at this bizarre specimen. And as I'm sure you're all aware by now, likes, shares, comments, reviews, and donations are all appreciated, and helps this scientific content reach new audiences. Thanks for helping out, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Hi, Christian. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. So we always like to get to know our interviewee first. So I'll just ask my standard opening question of how you got into the field of paleontology. Well, actually, I guess like so many people, I was intrigued by all kinds of natural things when I was a boy. And one day my uncle actually went up to me and he said, oh, Christian, do you want to collect golden snails in German Goldschnecken? And I was, of course, totally enthusiastic and didn't know what this was. And it turned out that they were actually early Jurassic ammonites, which were piratized. So we went there and back then he had actually a really fancy sort of race car like thing. And we went to this clay pit in, in southern Germany and we found really small but really cute little prioritized ammonites and I guess this is more or less when when it all started and some years later I actually found the same place the oldest brachyurin crab which was then named after me and I think at the latest by then was decided what kind what would happen to me at later years so to say. Oh that's awesome um I would like to ask about the ammonites and the crab, but I'm more interested in this car. Do you know what it was? Oh, I don't recall. Actually, you know, it's so long ago. I'm I'm so old in the meantime. It's like it must have been early 80s, I think, like 82, 81, something like that. And it was not a Porsche. It was not a German car. I think it was something so maybe Ferrari, then. Japanese. <laughs> No, no. It looked it looked really fast. Yeah, nice. Um, my early fossil hunting wasn't done in a sports car, so um, I'm a bit jealous. But never mind. Uh, what would you be doing then if you weren't a paleontologist? You mean as an, an alternative for what? Yeah. Um, we'll run your life again. You said golden snails, not interested. Uh -huh, okay. What became of you? So my, my plan B always was becoming a teacher, but I'm kind of happy that I'm what I am today because I actually do teach and I do enjoy that as well. And I do research and I think this is one of the greatest things you can do. So you're a professor now at the University of Zurich. Um, yeah. Where do your research interests lie? What's the normal day like for you? It's actually quite quite chaotic. It ranges from uh, 
hunting rhinoceroses in, in kindergartens in the forest while uh, um, examining soft tissue preservation in placoderms from Morocco to um, squids from Lebanon and ammonoids from everywhere, basically. So it's kind of... I'm jumping back and forth. I'm a bit hedonistic in my research. Whatever attracts my attention, this is actually way too much, <laughs> actually f gets my attention. So there's there's no kind of like unifying theme. Are you concentrated on a certain area or a certain group of fossils? Well, I do come back to cephalopods all the time and well, also taphonomy, exceptional preservation, soft tissue preservation, but also the Devonian. And I, I always had a certain love for, um, for big fishes like sharks and also placoderms. So I also keep coming back to these groups. And I've I've got an interest in the Devonian as well, and I can't really explain it. I just kind of look at it, and I'm like, yes, Devonians for me. Um, what is it about that time for you, and what is it about those groups, about these big fishes, and about the cephalopods that you find fascinating? So I think the Devonian is far away enough from us, time-wise, that it has a lot of really strange creatures which which we do not understand in full. So there is a lot of, let's say, detective work that needs to be done. A lot of questions we might never be able to 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 um, find good answers to, and there's just enough awkwardness and uh, strangeness and distance to make it really interesting and and intriguing. I find. Okay, so one of the groups that you work on are the cephalopods. And this episode is going to be on an ammonite or ammonoid. What, what's the difference between all of those terms? Um, so can you give us an introduction to the world of cephalopods? Uh, okay, so the, the, the ending ammonoid, ammonite, this basically refers to the group. So ammonoids actually encompass all the ammonoids, while the ammonites um, comprise only those which actually are from mainly Jurassic and um, Cretaceous times. So it's a kind of a taxonomic um, term, if you want. Is so is ammonite a subset of ammonoids? Exactly. Then? Okay. And uh, what are some of the other different um, cephalopod groups? So how do ammonoids differ from, say, belemnites or um, some of the other squiddy things? Okay, so maybe I give a short overview over um, cephalopod evolution, which started in the Cambrian. So there's a bunch of localities in the Cambrian. And actually, one of my PhD student, uh, students, Alex, is working on this and is going to publish some exciting new results there. So we have these very small conical shells at the beginning, which were found pretty much worldwide and which have very narrow chambers and which are actually quite small and have a ventral siphuncle. And these gave rise to a bunch of really interesting groups in the Ordovician already, and some of which re um, probably reached size of up to 10 meters. And one of those groups that originated in the Ordovician is the Orthocerids. And they are important because they later gave rise to the Bactritoids. And Bactritoids are kind of a inconspicuous little group which is not known by too many which has rather slender shells also conical with a ventral siphuncle some are coiled some are straight and these um, gave rise again to um, what are uh, the colloids so including squids belemnites and so forth on the one side and on the other side there's the ammonoids which simply continued coiling their shells and then became what we know as ammonoids so um but actually, the, uh, the, um, the bactrotids, they are paraphyletic. So there is an ongoing discussion whether we should include um, the bactrotids maybe in the colloids, and then the ammonoids would be colloids too. So, but now this is maybe a bit too too complicated here or too too special. I don't know. And, oh yes, <laughs> and the it's one of those things that you need you need to see the tree out in front of you. So. 
we'll try and we'll try and get that tree and then it's so much easier to follow than just with audio true but um yes so let's um just focus on the ammonites then um when you see an ammonite fossil typically what is it you're actually looking at um so well usually we we find the outer shell which is uh, usually coiled and um the cool thing about ammonites is actually they kind of carry their entire life history inside the, their shell so you have usually well if it's well preserved at least you have the embryonic shell in the middle which starts with a more or less spherical structure and then the following whorls wrap around it and if you if the shell is not preserved you can see the suture lines which are sometimes really beautiful and which are probably one of the reasons why many fossil collectors and um, paleontologists alike do like them. So those, the suture lines are the wiggly, like internal walls of each of the shells. Is that right? Well, more or less, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, it's like this. They have a chambered fragma cone, which was filled with gas, at least partially and partially with water. And these walls, they're actually folded, but they're only slightly folded in their center and towards the outside, so towards the, the, the line where they touched the outer shell wall, so to say, they became more and more folded. And this is what we call the suture line where they touch the shell wall. Okay. And, and there's something in the evolution of that, isn't there? Yes, there is. And it becomes more and more complicated. And the first suture lines are actually just gently wavy and look like not much. And this changed quite quickly and they became became um, much more complicated until it got really insane in the Mesozoic. And what advantage did that give? Did it give any or is it just, the, just one of those things that happens? Well, actually, I could talk probably for about an hour about the topic. Oh, yeah. So there, there is a uh, actually there's new papers coming up every year, and um, I think much of it is actually um, uh, fabricational noise, as Seiler has put it. So it has to do with the uh, with growth of the conch and with the formation of new scepter. And what happens is that actually the posterior mantle, the septal mantle, which forms the new septa, um, it kind of retains the shape of the previous septum. But then when it moves forward inside the, the, the shell tube, it has to, to fill a larger area, so to say. It's, so it grows outward. And while, while growing outward, it's, it starts folding. So the more often it kind of gets copied and the more often it has to grow outward, the more folds you get. So this is basically the process that's happening there. Mm, that's really interesting. I've, I've not actually heard uh, any of that. So yeah, that's a whole other episode to be done. But um, so we have um, this uh, variation in the suture lines, the, the back wall of the body chamber effectively, uh, and how it joins to the inside margin of the outer conch. So we've got that variation inside, but on the outside, we've just got a coiled shell. I mean, how much variation can there be in that outer coiled shell so that we can tell all of these different species apart? So there can be quite some variation within species and, of course, also um, between different species. And, and as you and as many of those people listening probably know, there is actually uh, enormous variation ranging from forms with straight shells like bac baculites to um, those which have, have really awkward not like shapes like uh, niponites or um, then the regularly coiled ones like, I don't know, Amethias, um, Stephanosaurus and whatever. So there's many species which are just regularly coiled. And what I really love about them is how they actually change their uh, coiling mode when they grow adult. And that is actually how we can also tell whether they're males and females with some certainty. 
I did not know this. What What's the difference between the two? So, um, well, this has been actually proposed already in the 60s, and remarkably, it was discovered simultaneously by a Polish and an, a British colleague. And um, what they realized is that within one layer, they sometimes kept finding uh, uh, two different forms which shared the internal worlds, the, the morphology of the internal worlds were, were, um, were identical, but towards the outside it changed. So there was one form which was much larger with a rather smooth shell and a rather simple aperture, while the other form stayed much smaller, had a much stronger ornament, and often a really strangely formed aperture with sometimes really awkward leopards on both sides. And these are um, probably what we think is the, the males. And this is supported actually by our new finding. Well, we'll get onto that soon. Um, I would like to know, do we know what the conch is made from? Is it always the same? <laughs> That's all real. Yeah, it's actually sort of interesting because sometimes you think, ah, this is well known. But then if you look more closely, you find out, ah, it's actually not that well known. <laughs> um, and this applies here as well. For example, we do know that most of it is aragonite. So these little tiny platelets, um, which are hexagonal, which are arranged in stacks. And in between, we have actually organic matter. And this um, causes that it has this nacreous luster if they're really well preserved. And, but I know from a Czech co colleague, um, Jerzy Frieda, he um, looked more closely at the structure of ammonite shells and he figured out that actually there's a very thin layer of calcite hidden within, which has never been described. So I'm waiting actually for him to publish this one day. I've got a feeling, as you said, that every question that I'm asking is going to have an answer that's like, well, actually, it's incredibly complicated. <laughs> I've, I've never had that for something so... Some of these um, questions, I wrote them down thinking, oh, this will be a nice, simple question, like, what's the shell made out of? Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's just a, a great subject. Ammonites, there's, there's so much, like, I personally have already found out and we're not even through the introduction yet. <laughs> so um, you mentioned the nacre, which is the kind of like crazy colored uh, pearly kind of material. Is that right? Yeah. Um, do we actually find pearls in ammonites as we yes, do in we do. some other mollusks? Yes, <gasps> we do. And um, we described that actually, well, this has been described early on from the Cretaceous and we described this, um, so Kenneth de Bartz and me, um, some years ago from uh, Devonian ammonites. But in this case, they were fixed pearls. So they were attached to the inside of the conch. So sometimes they are loose. That's what we use for earrings and so forth. And sometimes they really um, are kind of glued to the uh, shell wall, so to say. And usually they surround um, foreign objects like sand grains or sometimes parasites. And back then, we, when we described that, we suggested that was parasites that were kind of encased by that aragonite, by basically by these pearls. How much would a ammonitic pearl be worth? Well, I guess it's like with um, with crystals, like like diamonds, and I don't know what. Um, I would say it depends on the luster and uh, uh, the shape and whatever. And and but I think usually they don't look like much because the aragonite is often not so nice, so you don't have a this mother of pearl like luster. And um, so I guess it wouldn't be it wouldn't reach um, like really big prizes. I guess. So we're going to get on to uh, the subjects of your of, of a recent paper that you published on a very special ammonite. So let's first set the stage of when and where it was found. Okay, so it was found near Eichstätt, and Eichstätt is um, a beautiful little town in uh, in northern Bavaria in Germany, and Eichstätt is 
actually not far away from Sollenhofen. And if you look at this area in Google Earth or Google Maps under the satellite photos, um, then you see that it's actually, it looks like um, someone suffering from a terrible acne because it's full of little quarries. And this region has become famous for its platy limestones. And these were used in early times of bookmaking um, for printing. So for lithography. That's why it's also called lithographic limestone. And um, because there are so many quarries, people started finding really amazing fossils like the iconic Archaeopteryx and plenty of soft-tissued animals, uh, fishes, reptiles, and what uh, beautiful pterosaurs, actually. And also, um, interestingly, preserved um, uh, cephalopods, including ammonites and um, quite broad wide uh, variety of colloids like of squid like animals okay and what kind of um paleo environment do do these lithographic limestones represent so um Classically, this is seen as sort of an archipelago of um, small islands and lagoons in between in a more or less tropical sea. And um, the sheltered situation of these lagoons between islands or uh, reef complexes explains why there wasn't too much water movement and why there was maybe also not too much, much oxygen near the sediment surface. And this explains why we get an exceptional preservation because there was not too much scavenging and um, the decay process were rather slow and the mechanical disturb um, disturb Perturbations like uh, would also be minimal because there were no avalanches, no ground uh, touching waves, and I don't know what. Okay, and um, there's there's been a couple of uh, specimens found of uh, these ammonites that we're going to talk about, and they were found at different sites. So you've got, uh, pardon my German, uh, one at Nusblingen and another at uh, Wintershof. Yeah, is the any difference between the two sites or is it just a continuation of the same kind of limestone between the two? So Nussblingen actually is a little bit older. It's a really small quarry, which is in, in, in Baden-Württemberg, which is actually quite far away from the um, Eichstätt-Sollenhofen region. But we have the same kind of preservation. It's a bit older and we have quite similar fossils there. Wintershof is just next to Eichstätt, so it really belongs to, the, to this area. And, um, well, it's interesting because of the similar preservation. And we use the specimen for Nussblingen mainly for... for uh, comparison and in Nussblingen it's like this like like in Pinten that we have a different organic preservation so um, stuff like uh, the, the the jaws which are which have been chitinous they're actually they appear in a, in a brownish to blackish sub substance so they're actually much better visible than than is the case in in the Solhofen Eichstätt region um, where often we do see the structures, but they don't have this neat brownish col uh, color. Okay, so now that we've set that stage, let's focus on these remarkable specimens that have been found themselves. So what is so special about them? So um, the special thing about this one specimen is that it is actually a, um, the soft parts, basically, of, a set of an ammonite with its jaws that must have fallen out somehow of the shell. And this is something which I have never come across before and which is intriguing by itself. But I must say at the beginning when I saw it, I was like, oh, cool, interesting, but I have no idea what I'm seeing exactly. Um, so yeah, we, we don't normally get soft parts preserved at all, do we? Um, but this time it's, it's completely the opposite way around. We normally find the hard parts without the soft, but in this instance, we've got the soft parts without the hard. Well, that's not 
entirely correct because we do have the jaws and they are hard. And that is actually how we know that these are ammonites because the lower jaw of many of these Jurassic and um, Cretaceous ammonites are often made of calcite. And this um, makes the likelihood of being preserved very high. And they're very typical. And this is why we were actually able to determine the genus of this ammonite. So we know which kind of conch would belong to that soft part, so to say. Um, so this was quite important. And um, this is how we knew at all that this was a was an ammonite. Okay, that, that's amazing. Um, but in general, what did we know about the soft parts of ammonites prior to the discovery of uh, these ones from Nusplingen and Winterhof? Well, there's uh, very little we, we, we knew. Um, there's a couple of cases of uh, uh, stomach contents that are, pres that are preserved. For example, also from the sonhofen eichstätt region, from Lebanon, and also from, from Russia a little bit. And from Russia, we also know ovaries preserved with embryos of ammonites. And a couple of years ago, I described soft parts from the Cretaceous of Germany, where we do see quite a lot, like the also the entire digestive tract. And I suggest that we do see um, the brain and maybe the base of the arm crown. But that was not very certain. And there's another um, specimen that has been actually... No, it has, yes, it has been published, but not in great detail from the Middle Jurassic of, um, of the UK. Wow, I didn't really realize it was that much we knew about the soft body. Yeah, well, actually, it's not that much because if you take into account how many millions of ammonites have been collected by private people and um, by paleontologists, that is actually just a few places and specimens which do show soft parts. And there's a lot of things we don't know. Like, for example, we still don't know what the arms looked like. Okay. But with this specimen, what can we actually see in this? Do we, do we have the arms in this one? That is actually also intriguing because the arms are not there. But the question is, are they not preserved or do we just not see them because they maybe are lying underneath or they have been, been in the other plate, which has not been found. So there's different options or they were ripped off. In, in the course of uh, the soft parts being removed from the conch. So I don't really know what happened there. But besides, we do see a lot. We see the entire digestive tract. And this was actually how I started. So um, we, well, it was obvious that there's the jaws and the jaws, they must be at the anterior end of the body. And then I, I kind of tried to follow the logical sequence of body parts, which we know from cephalopods. And then there's one thing which is kind of interesting because the esophagus is often covered by a thin sheet of chitin. And chitin is often preserved in phosphates. And the phosphates, in turn, um, they shine when we um, put a UV light onto it. And this is what I saw when I looked at the UV photos, which were ta taken by my co-author Helmut Tischlinger. Okay, so you managed to trace all of this digestive track all the way back. Um, were there any surprises in the anatomy that you could see? Were the were the things that you found that had never been seen before that you had to interpret based on, I don't know, what we know from nautiloids, for example? So um, as I just started to explain, I followed the digestive tract. And then the next thing I could identify was actually a so-called cololite. So this is basically uh, in the making, which is still in the intestine. This is how I, <laughs> I identified the, the intestine. And this helped me identify in, term, in, in turn the, the stomach which is quite a reasonably big structure. And in, in cephalopods, it's like this, that the intestine um, actually leads to the back of the mantle cavity. And um, this is also where the, the gills are located. And that is why, how I could identify those. And in the end, I had a strange structure, which was actually sort of underneath the stomach. 
And I wasn't so sure what that was, but I was kind of guessing that this might have to do with the reproductive organs because they are usually way back in the body chamber. And this is what we have in Nautilus. And this is kind of also the situation we have in and squids and octopuses. So, and then I looked again at the UV light photos and I saw little comma shaped structures in this um, uh, bigger structure. And then I went to the literature and looked at the, what we see in Nautilus and uh, it, it looked quite similar to what we have actually in the male reproductive organs of living Nautilus. So we've got uh, an unfortunate male here that's uh, lost its shell. Yeah, that is what I think. Um, that has, there was actually some some discussion online about this because um, uh, a, a colleague, or let's say, collector from um, from Spain, he said, "Ah, I don't think this is a microcong, so there might be a problem here." And and um, yeah, I don't know. But in any case, I'm actually pretty sure that this is the male reproductive organs because I identified. Uh, a series of structures um, which we see in, in the male reproductive organs in Nautilus, like the two spermatophore sacs and um, also, well, the penis basically and um, the spermatophoric gland. So these four structures are all visible in that fossil. So um, I think this is, to me, it was pretty convincing at least. Nice. Um, you mentioned what I bleeped out before uh, was uh, the digestive contents. Um, can you tell what it was eating? Well, on this particular specimen, I can't because this, um, let's say, a little bit of which is still in its intestine um, is just yeah, just a very fine-grained mass of stuff. So you, I cannot tell. But there's other findings from the Sonhofen Eichstätt area, and from that we know that they fed on small animals, uh, including other ammonites and um, swimming sea lilies, crinoids, and um, I think there's also ostracods, as far as I remember. But I would have to look that up. But there's a bunch of small animals they were eating, and that is more or less well known. Well known to ammonite researchers, this is all news to me. This is fantastic. I just didn't know you could get so much information from ammonites. I, this interview is blowing my mind. Um, so, um, right, we have this fantastic, um, all of this fantastic soft body information. But to me, and possibly to many of our listeners, we've we've got the pictures on our website and as the YouTube cover picture, everything like that. What is, I mean, it's it, to me, is just a load of blobs of different colors. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to make out. I, I don't look at it and think, oh, you know what? That's an, that's an ammonite just missing its shell. So how hard was it to interpret for you did you were you able to just look at it and be like yes that's an ammonite and then when it was collected was it instantly recognized as an ammonite without its shell or did it just sit in a museum for decades with no one really knowing what it was so the it was a collector who found it and, and i think he knew immediately what it was um, that because of the lower jaw because this is very typical and the the, the people collecting fossils in the Sonhofen Eichstätt area they know these um, these jaws so he surely recognized that immediately but he was surprised about um, the other parts and um, I then got the photos um, via Günther Schweigert, who is also co-author. And then actually, I, as I said, I, I recognized this as soft parts, but um, I wasn't able to tell right away what is what. And um, what I usually do in, in such cases is I first make some drawings. And then I try to homologize part by part. And that is what I did. And uh, actually, it started with the esophagus because, as I said, this was shining under UV light. And the esophagus has a strange kink. And this kink I knew from other ammonites and also from Nautilus. So this helped me to identify this. And then a little later, I discovered this little color light, so the um, unready, so to say. And this is how I step by step 
managed to identify the parts. Ah, and what I forgot to say, actually, between me starting to work on these this fossil and getting the photos about a year or two past where I wasn't too sure how to handle it. Are we are we talking uh, the UV photos there? Well, um, the UV photos I got only later, but they were important because they helped me to recognize both the esophagus and um, the uh, spermatophores because I didn't see them um, at first in the white light photos, in the normal photos. Mm. So I, I find it really interesting. We've done an interview on um, UV light, especially in terms of what you can see in dinosaurs, I think it was, uh, that interview. Um, and I'm really interested in it, in it as a new um, method for seeing more in fossils. So without it, would it have been possible to have interpreted all of the anatomy of this ammonite or did it play a, a really critical role? It actually played an important role because I think I would have had much more trouble identifying the es esophagus. And you just see different things and you see the things also differently. So it helps you getting ideas and helps you homologizing. And sometimes it shows details much clearer and crisper. So you can really um, figure out what you're actually looking at um, yeah, so I think it's like when you have an illness and you ask two doctors, that's sometimes better than asking one, you know, like you have, you have two, you get kind of two different opinions and this helps you figuring out what you're actually looking at. And this might be even, well, this is probably especially true for soft tissues, no matter if they're from a, f a funny dinosaur butt or from, from a nemonite. So reference to the dinosaur butt there, that was the new paper um, by Jakob, who's also been on this show. And uh, that was UV light on a Tatakosaurus mm -hmm. that revealed details of its cloaca. So that's some big news. If you haven't already uh, seen that one, go check that out, dinosaur bum. Um, but back on Ammonites, um, you mentioned before that the the crown of arms so in i guess layman's terms the tentacles i know they're not tentacles that's a very specific thing but the the wiggly arms at the front we don't know um about those but is there anything else that's still left unknown about their anatomy any specific like um organs that have never been seen before um, that's a good question. Um, well, I actually, there's a lot of things we do have because, for example, interestingly, the, um, the brain is encased in, in a, also in a chitinous, uh, shell, so to say, which is also preserved occasionally. And also in this specimen, I think there's some remains of it seen. The eyes are not very well preserved, but I think there is um, remains of the eyes, or at least of the uh, optic part of the brain preserved. And But the thing that would really interest me the most is um, the, the arm crown, as you said, because we can make kind of, let's say, estimated guesses that they had 10 arms. And based on, on this, well, the absence of preservation, we can conclude that they were not really strong and thick and so on. They must have been probably rather fine and short um, because otherwise we would have seen in the sediments we um, um, of the Solnhofen Eichstätt region, um, we would have seen imprints sometimes because we've seen imprints of the arms of all sorts of squids and octopuses um, preserved there. Do they have um, hooks on their arms? That's also a good question, but no, they, do. well, huh, actually, <laughs> I was about to say no, but this is not entirely certain at this point. So most ammonoids did not have arm hooks. Arm hooks are a feature we usually know from belemnites and their relatives, but there is a structure that has been des described recently from uh, Cretaceous uh, ammonites by Isabel Kruta and some colleagues, and this might 
be arm hooks of some speci um, specialized reproductive arm or so, which had hook-like structures on the surface. At least this is the best interpretation for the time being, but this is just, the, just this one um, genus where this has been described so far. Otherwise, there's no hooks. Okay. So now we have this fantastic record of an internal anatomy of an ammonite, but we now have to solve this mystery as to why we have this ammonite without its conch in the first place. So what have been some of the hypotheses as to where the where the shell went where, the, where where is it and and what are the likelihoods relatively of each hypothesis being true well so one would be simply it has been dissolved um, because aragonite is never preserved well not never but om almost uh, very rarely in, in in this region and and um, but this is unlikely because we would at least normally see an imprint of the shell so like a kind of a cast or so and it's, that's not there so that is unlikely the second hypothesis would be that the animal somehow died and then the muscular attachment of the soft parts to, sh to the shell um started rotting and became loose and maybe due to wave action or so it just kind of fell out of the shell and sank down and the third hypothesis is that it was a predator that pulled out the soft parts so and this is actually what we think is the most plausible explanation okay uh is there any way to test these hypotheses can you get a bunch of uh, modern Nautilus, uh, kill them all, and then see if you can shake them loose or pull them out or something like this? Is there is there any way to say for certain? Okay, so first of all, the connection of, of the soft body to the shell is quite weak. And this has to do with the fact that during growth, the ammonite has to kind of loosen this attachment again and again to move forward within the body chamber to give space for new chambers that are, that are forming at the rear end. So the connection is not very strong. And we know that at least in, in modern nautiluses, the, the connection is also quite, yeah, loose so to say and when they're dead it's quite easy to take the soft parts out so um for for the other hypothesis about predation um there is a hypothesis by a clomp marker who was published some uh, about 10 years ago where he realized that many ammonites from the mesozoic particularly they have kind of a hole in the back of the body chamber which was not there primarily. So he suggested that this is um, a trace of predation where some animal cracked open the rear of the body chamber. And this is interesting because this is where the main muscles inserted. And if you would loosen that connection, you would get out the, the soft parts quite easily. Because otherwise, what happens if you try to get the soft parts from the front? The animal would just withdraw its soft parts far back into the body chamber. There would be no way of reaching it. And this is something that also has been demonstrated actually by Björn Kröger from Helsinki, who showed that um, there is healed um, cracks in, in, the, in the body chambers of ammonites, which went back for like, I don't know, like a quarter world or so, which were healed. So there was enough of the soft parts that survived and were able to repair that massive damage that was inflicted by some predator. That would take a lot of intelligence to specifically attack those muscles, wouldn't it? Yes, I totally agree. And I mean, in the sea, we have a bunch of intelligent creatures, and these are, of course, vertebrates. But along, among the invertebrates, these are the, are the cephalopods. And actually, this is something um, I was discussing with my co-authors quite um, uh, lengthily, so to say, because first I thought this could have been pycnodontid fish, which have really massive crushing dentitions and they are also known from this area so that this could have been possible but then they argued yes they do occur but they are extremely rare by contrast um 
Collioids, so um, octopus relatives, they're actually quite common. And as you know, they're really clever animals. And it is quite well possible that with their quite pointed beaks, they were able to crack open the rather thin shells of ammonites. That's, uh, yeah, it's remarkable that you could have this possible record of a failed predation um why 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 might it have failed though well that's a good question i mean um possible what's also possible there was again a larger predator disturbing the smaller predator trying to eat the ammonite so it was disturbed by something or maybe there was a big wave or i don't know what and for example what we have described last year is that occasionally even pterosaurs were fishing for a squid from the sea we have direct evidence for that so maybe there was a pterosaur touching the, the sea surface the the squid was shocked swam away and dropped the ammonite. This would have been a possibility, but it's of course highly speculative, I must admit. <laughs> um, I find it interesting as well that um, we have this specimen preserved um, without its shell, whereas the other ammonites that might have died in their shells and sank to the bottom don't have the soft parts as well um do you think that in this location or i suppose in any other location we'll find a hundred percent complete ammonite soft body pretty much the same as you've got here but also the shell with it well um i think if we really have the shell preserved, then we probably wouldn't see it simply. So what we need is really this kind of um, fossil Lagerstätte as we have in um, the Sollenhofen Eichstätt area, in Nusblingen, but also in, let's say, Christian Malford or in, um, in Lebanon, or we described recently fossils from, um, from the late Cretaceous of Greece. So if you have these lithographic limestones with these very flat, um, limestone bits and with an organic preservation of soft tissues, I think this is where the chance is the greatest that we do find something that is even more complete, where we have, let's say, an imprint of the conch plus um, the soft parts preserved in one way or the other. Uh, is there still a lot we don't know about ammonites? Well, I mean, if you look at the fossils, you see, okay, I kind of could make out what's what, but you don't see a great lot of details. And now this is just one species out of thousands, and it is also lacking a lot of detail. Like, for example, I would like to see more detail of the brain. I would like to see the precise position of the eyes. It sounds like a simple thing because, I mean, if you look at vertebrates, it's always immediately clear. Where are the eyes? But in the case of ammonites, no, it's not clear. Are they above the jaws? Are they next to the jaws? Are they in front of the jaws? What do they do when they um, close the the jaws, let's say, to protect the soft parts, did they pull the, the eyes behind the jaws or were they still peeking out? There's, there's so many open questions. Um, it's really insane. I think every new soft tissue ammonoid uh, has the potential of revealing interesting new information. And what would you say to a student or someone that is considering studying ammonites? You mean like what to do? No, uh, how to enthuse them with your love for ammonites. <laughs> yeah, I think what's cool about ammonites is, first of all, there's a lot of things that are still unknown, although there's probably thousands of papers that have been written about them. And they, the cool thing about them is that they actually carry their own life history in their, in their kongs. And you can 
study Evo Devo with them. You can study variation. You can even study ecological things. You can study the isotopes in their shells to reconstruct paleo temperatures. You can, um, we have now a paper in, in work with a student of mine with Celine um, about one proxy where we can actually show that um, ocean acidification had an eff effect on, on their conks. So there's so many things where you can use them and, and uh, draw conclusions on paleoecology, paleoenvironment that is really far from being uh, explored in full. That's awesome. And we'll look forward to all of those discoveries once you make them back on the show. So uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Thank you very much for having me. And um, I hope the people listening to it, you enjoyed it a little bit. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall and Liz Martin Silverstone, with contributions from Tom Fletcher, Vish Venkat, and Elsa Pancharoli. Music was composed by Patrick Kendall Smith. Paleocast was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on funding from you, the listeners. So, if you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.